Welcome, everyone. Economic topic for the afternoon. Today's task will be to look at public education as if it were a real enterprise that had to make the grade as a public investment, which would mean we were judging the public education sector by criteria, like whether it was transparent, it was accountable for results, it spent money efficiently, and allocated jobs to those best able to perform. Of course, in fairness, that business lens can only go so far. Businesses operate in markets that ruthlessly reallocate capital to high performers and take it away from failing players. Markets generally keep you from getting more money or more customers, even if you're producing lousy results. Public education, on the other hand, operates in a highly regulated and politicized space, generally insulated from market pressure. But even in that context, our panelists have managed to bring results and accountability to the public education space. So I'm going to ask them to come out and introduce them as they do. Uh, Michelle Ree, the chancellor of the DC public school system and the former CEO and founder of the New Teacher Project. John Schnur, the founder and CEO of the nonprofit New Leaders for New Schools. John Chubb, Managing Director of the Edison Learning Institute and former co-founder with Chris Whittle of Edison Schools. And Jason Camaras, the Director of Human Capital Strategy for the District of Columbia Public Schools and the 2005 National Teacher of the Year. And you may notice we're missing one panelist. Um, Jason is an addition. Welcome, Jason. We're missing Mike Feinberg, who is staying in Houston, where his KIPP schools have no power, and he wasn't sure he could get out and be with us, but he sends his best to all of us. Finally, uh, we have uh, one more participant this afternoon, Ted Mitchell, the CEO of the New Schools Venture Fund. Uh, Ted is going to act for us today as our public surrogate, commenting on the uh, validity of these large investments that we're making in public education. And Ted is uh, not only the CEO of New Schools Venture Fund, but he's perfect for this role because Ted is also the president of the California State Board of Education. So what we're going to try to do today is probe the success of these panelists by using the lens of a business investor to look at the way that specific reforms our panelists have instituted are bringing about a new culture of accountability and results in the public education space. And then part two will transition to what is probably an even harder issue than today's success, how these reforms and results can be sustained across time. So we're going to start by asking Ted, our surrogate for the public, to just address a few of the key reform criteria that he'll be using to comment on our panelists' work. Ted. Great. Thanks, Catherine. And uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging in there through the afternoon. Uh, I think that this has uh, been a great day. And, and this is where, uh, to paraphrase Bill Green, we um, put the special sauce uh, back uh, in, into education. Uh, and so let me tell you a little bit about the five criteria that I'm going to have in mind as, as uh, we engage in this discussion today. Uh, first of all, uh, are the initiatives that we're talking about uh, initiatives that are focused on higher student outcomes, particularly for kids who are traditionally underserved by our current system? Second, are the results of these initiatives uh, measurable with very clear metrics? And are they measurable in a way that matters to kids, can inform the next cycle of an instructional improvement and professional development, and be transparent to parents, communities, and policymakers. Third, are these initiatives scalable and or replicable? Fourth, can the team execute? And, and over the course of lunch, I understood that execute has a, a certain desperate finality to it. And so I'm going to turn to deliverology. <laughs> and so uh, can the team embody deliverology? Uh, uh, Michael, is that a correct usage of the term? And then fifth. Um, is there a demand that will make the venture or the initiative sustainable, which Catherine, I think, sort of bridges over to our, the second part of our conversation today. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Ted. 
So we're going to turn to the panelists and ask each of them to give opening statements about how the specific work that they do has brought accountability and results to public education. Each of you is extremely results oriented, so we'd like to ask you what are the most important things you're doing to provide this return for the public's significant investment in education? And we'll start with Michelle Reed. Um, so I, I guess if we're looking at this um, as a question of whether or not you should invest, um, probably DCPS would be the last place you would want to um, invest your money, or has been of life over the past uh, few years. Um, you know, we're a, a district of 50,000 students. Um, that uh, enrollment number has been steadily uh, decreasing. Uh, over the years with the um, with a strong entry of charters into the market uh, we are um, a district where uh, we are the only school district across the country um, that's on high risk status with the US Department of Education uh, we have a an achievement gap between our wealthy white students and our poor and minority students about 70 percentage points uh, at the secondary level in some subject areas and of all of our ninth graders who begin school with us, only 9% of them graduate from college within five years. Uh, so the outlook um, within the district for the last few years has been extraordinarily dismal. Um, but you know, I, I like to consider us the dark horse that you know you wait until it hits rock bottom and then you invest um, because it's it's cheap. You know, the the risk isn't as is great, um, and the upside potential uh, is 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 significant. Um, we have done a tremendous amount over the last 15 months since I've been in this job uh, to try to tr uh, turn the tide. Um, in in the district, and I think it can essentially sort of be boiled down to this idea of trying to first create the conditions for success in the district. Um, the first thing, uh, far and away, uh, the most important in my mind is the governance structure that we're currently operating under. Um, we, uh, we did away with the uh, school board, um, so I do not answer to uh, a school board at all, whether it's elected or um, appointed. Um, I answer only to the mayor, uh, and he has been absolutely unbelievable in his um, focus on education and his support of the efforts uh, that we've been undertaking, which I think is incredibly unusual for a politician, um, given the, the kinds of reforms we've been undertaking. Um, you know, we've been closing schools, we've been uh, firing people, we uh, just, um, we, we, uh, one of our first moves was to uh, get legislation passed through uh, the city council that would allow us to turn central office employees into at-will employees. Um, and through all of these uh, efforts, um, he has been behind us 100%, despite a lot of sort of noise and opposition. Um, so the leadership uh, piece is, uh, is in place. I think second, um, the accountability uh, is definitely uh, uh, here. Um, I'm accountable to the mayor. We set very uh, specific um, metrics of success for the district and for what we're doing. And we are taking that down to the classroom level next, where we will be engaged in ensuring that every single teacher in the system is held accountable for the uh, results that they see in student achievement for the kids in their classroom. Um, so accountability, obviously, is huge. Uh, and then I think last is, is just sort of the ideas that we have and the, um, the, the sort of courage or the, or the lack of um, interest, perhaps, uh, in, in sort of playing it politically safe. Um, the things that we've been taking on, I mean, I, I think that most school district superintendents across the country um, would say the exact same things about the need to do uh, what we've taken on over the last year. There just um, isn't often the political will that goes behind it. Um, and I think that if there's one thing that I've learned over the last 15 months, um, it's that you know cooperation and collaboration and consensus building are way overrated. Um, I, I, you know, people people often say to me, um, you know, the, uh, well, the teachers union, for example, the teachers unions are here to stay. Um, they're going to be players in this. You have to you have to find a way to get along. Um, and I actually disagree with that. I think that you know it's important for us to sort of lay out on the front end, um, you know, what what we're willing to do, um, but what our bottom line is for kids. And if the if the teachers unions are not going to come along with that, and and they have every right, you know, they, they have a different agenda. They have a different uh, a constituent that they're serving. Um, but the bottom line is that you know if if you can't 
come to agreement um, through through a consensus and collaboration, then you're going to have to push your agenda in a different way. And I think that um, we're, we're absolutely willing to do that. Um, so that's a little bit about where we are. I'm going to let Jason talk specifically about the, the accountability system that we've set up for, for teachers because I think in many ways this is going to be the crux of, um, of, of our ability to see really substantial changes um, in the quality of instruction that happens every day in the classroom. And that's, at the end of the day, what it comes down to for me is that you know, all of these things that we're talking about are well and good, and I know that, that, that we've um, you know, sort of, uh, there, there's a lot of excitement about what we're doing here in DC, but none of these changes in the end will make any difference um, if, it doesn't, uh, if it doesn't result in significantly um, higher learning outcomes for kids and closing the achievement gap um, and holding people in the classroom accountable for that is the bottom line of what we have to do. Thank you. Why don't we jump to Jason? Okay. Uh, so basically what I do all day is try to figure out how we get a highly effective as opposed to highly qualified teacher into every single classroom in DC and keep them there. And um, you know, we have a lot of great folks, a lot of effective folks in the system. We want to hold on to them. Um, but we also recognize that not every teacher is performing at the level that we would like on behalf of our kids, so we need to think about how do we address that. And so, as, um, as the Chancellor said, we are in the process of developing a very serious accountability system for teacher performance. And this is something that we all talk a lot about in forums such as this. And what I've realized over the past year is that the devil lies in the details on things like this. Um, we all want to hold teachers accountable. Um, it gets difficult when you kind of sit down and try to figure out how to do that. Uh, but I will say this, I can kind of sketch out sort of the broad ideas. Number one, for the folks for whom we have student achievement data, that will be by and large the overwhelming factor that will determine our evaluation of them. Um, we are developing growth models that give us a very sophisticated idea of, of how teacher students are doing. Um, and, and for those folks, that will be the major uh, criterion. But we should also recognize that we have a large part of the school system for which we don't have standardized test data at this point. And so for those folks, and for the folks for whom we have test data, we're developing a very rigorous uh, rubric-based observational framework. So we're trying to take the best learning we have uh, from research, from Teach for America, from all other places, about what are the core actions and behaviors that successful, that is effective teachers do, and then create our instructional framework around those behaviors. And that is what we're going to train our principals to evaluate on. That is what we're aligning our professional development on. That's what we're going to align our uh, selection system on. And then we're going to uh, rigorously evaluate folks on this rubric. Now, we don't know, to be totally honest, if these things match up with student achievement. We have some research which suggests that they do. But what we're going to do is, over time, make sure that these observables, we'll study them against our student achievement data to make sure that we're constantly looking at the things that actually matter for student achievement. So we're developing this, uh, this new evaluation system, which we'll be able to roll out next fall. Uh, we're very excited about it. I think it's really going to enable us to know, with a very high degree of specificity, who's performing well and who's not and enable us to make really smart decisions based on that data. One of the things that we would like to do is to pay folks who are doing well a lot more money. And you may have read about that in the Washington Post. And uh, we believe that that's, that's a really key lever for change. And um, not only, I'm not necessarily one of these people who believes that it actually makes people work harder. I hope that it does. But what I do think it does is it's a signal that we are a system about performance. And for better or worse in America, we show value by putting dollars on the table. And we want to show people that excellence will be rewarded and rewarded significantly. So that teaching in DC will really be um, the most lucrative place to do it in the country and also the most prestigious place to do it. And the last thing I'll, I'll just say on this is um, there is that other flip side, which um, you know, is, is difficult to talk about. And that is, we are going to transition out low performers. That is our obligation to our kids. And uh, you know, when I talk about this, I want to emphasize a really key point that I think some folks don't realize. 
It's not only important because we know the research shows us that low performers can do significant harm to kids, but transitioning out low performers is actually one of the most important retention strategies for high performers. Think about your own professions, what you do every day. Nobody wants to work in a situation where there are low performers. And so by us making that commitment, we are ensuring that the high performers are surrounded by like-minded folks so that we can be successful for all of our kids. Okay, thank you. John Schnur, you are uh, recruiting, training, and placing principals in nine urban school districts, districts in the country. Tell us about the specific things you're doing with that core of people to drive accountability and results. Well, I'm excited to <clears throat> talk about what we're doing and learning uh, at New Leaders for New Schools. Um, I think it is one way, uh, one vehicle in the country that we're learning from educators who are getting results and then tra translating those results, what, what's been learned from those results into broader insights for system change and policy. And to that end, I just want to um, um, salute and kind of underscore the importance of, of Jason Cameron's last words as a former National Teacher of the Year, somebody who's been a teacher in the classroom working with kids in the District of Columbia, recognized for his efforts nationally. I think that the too often the voices of educators who've gotten great results for kids have not often been listened to and translated into policy and practice. And I just think it's really important that Jason's on this panel. Um, And the second uh, comment I'd make before I'll dive into the specifics is that New Leaders for New Schools is, you know, by some known as a nonprofit, uh, known as a, a nonprofit social enterprise, a nonprofit organization that's trying to build, blend the best of a biz the business world with a focus on metrics and organizational effectiveness and growth with the best in education and the nonprofit world, understanding what's good for kids and having a mission to help society and schools. And I would say, as you think about this question about investment in public education, that one of, I certainly wouldn't advocate investing in social enterprises or nonprofits as a, a substitute for in, investing in public education. But I do think some of the most promising efforts, the most promising um, research and development that's being done today in education is being done through these social enterprises, whether New Leaders for New Schools, recruiting and training principals to Teach for America, to the New Teachers Project, to the KIPP charter schools and others. And I do think for people thinking about investing in things that scale and ultimately will impact the way the entire public sector is organized, this is a very compelling type of organizational form to consider as you're thinking about investing. Again, in, in, in sup to supplement, not replace, supporting where there's real reform being done to make change uh, results and outcomes for kids in public education. So building on those, New Leaders for New Schools is built on one simple uh, or two simple insights. One is, is that um, every child from all backgrounds, in fact, can and does achieve at high levels um, when he or she gets really good instruction and good support and the right kind of relationships. We've demonstrated in pockets in our country. We have individual classrooms and schools serving low-income kids where all kids are succeeding at high levels. It's a very small number of classrooms and schools serving low-income kids that demonstrate that, but it's, been de it's demonstrably true that it's possible, and the question is, is how do we scale that? Our second insight is while there's no silver bullet, that one crucial step is having an outstanding principal. As I've looked, and we've looked across the country, at schools getting incredible results for kids from low-income backgrounds, in virtually every school there is an outstanding principal. A principal who brings the staff, the students, the community together on a very clear mission, focused on high standards for all students, who provides the kind of change leadership, the people management, the instructional leadership, and the culture leadership that brings an entire school together on getting great results. And when we started New Leaders for New Schools eight years ago, we thought, you know what, why be systemic in your reforms assuming mediocrity in the principal's chair or the teacher's classroom? And I feel like some of the systemic reforms were assuming that. We thought, why not be systemic about attracting and training and developing a next generation of outstanding, in our case, principals? And at New Leaders, we uh, have had 9,000 people apply for our first 550 fellowships, about 15 times as many um, applicants as slots. Uh, speaking of the demand side to Ted's question, a lot more people interested in the job than can be accommodated. A lot more cities applying through our city competition than can be accommodated. Uh, we've built a strong training program. And let me just briefly close um, for, on, what I, on my comments now on our results so far. Because if I were to tell you about, would you uh, invest in new leaders for new schools? I would say don't invest in new leaders from schools because we've created a demonstrable model to get incredible outcomes for kids nationwide. If I think anybody told you that um, in public education at scale, they wouldn't be telling you the truth. We've not demonstrated yet our capacity to do that. 
But at New Leaders, what we have demonstrated, in addition to having a lot of talent and good training, a lot of great supporters, is we have demonstrated the capacity of a data-driven organization to drive continuous improvement to get better and better outcomes for kids. And so our results so far, being very transparent about these, the RAND Corporation is doing a multi-year longitudinal evaluation of our work, of every student and every school led by New Leaders principals. And there's some good news and some not so good news, and I think transparency is important. With the kids in schools led by New Leaders principals are making faster progress in academic achievement than their counterparts, their peers, in the school systems we're serving. But the gains, we could say this is outperformance, are at such an incremental level across our community that it's not closing the achievement gap. In the cities where we can measure this, kids are making on average a couple months more of learning than their peers in the school systems. But our kids are generally four years behind. And so making two, if you're a seventh grader, at third grade levels, two months a year is not enough. So I'd say we're not there yet. But that said, we've been analyzing a, a, among our schools and others, who are the ones that are making dramatic gains that in five years would get, be on track to get 90 to 100 percent of kids at grade level or above. And all of our new leaders sign on to a six-year goal of 90 to 100 percent success levels for kids as measured by the state assessment and 90 to 100 percent graduation rates. We had last year 18 percent of our schools make those kind of dramatic gains. We used a lot of data focused relentlessly on improving it. And this year it looks like we've got about 30 percent making dramatic gains. Now 70 percent aren't. But what I'll tell you is, to me, it's an example of when you're focused on results and focused on data, you've got the right talent and the right support in there, you can make dramatic, significant improvement even if we're not all the way there. And I think when you look at anything in education, you ought to look at a focus on results, a focus on talent, and an honest, transparent look at data to see whether people are using it to make improvements. Okay, thank you. So, John Chubb, we're giving you a, um, a heavy weight to carry this afternoon because we're asking you to really speak for the whole of the for-profit community within education. John, um, within Edison, tell us what you're working on to try to drive results in the public education space. Well, I'm, I'm going to recommend two investments. Uh, one is teachers, and the other is technology. Uh, for the last 15 years, I've had the privilege of working uh, in a private, uh, private sector company and um, have been part of efforts to raise hundreds of millions of dollars. And I'll tell you that uh, the business community, people who invest in new companies in any field, when they invest in education, what they're looking for is what we've talked about all day, which are enterprises that know how to make a difference for kids. Uh, business knows how important the quality of the workforce is, they know the challenges that we face, and they're interested in investing in companies that can make a difference. Um, if I was making recommendations to public education today and what to invest, uh, I would base it on the experience that we've had over the last 15 years working in inner city communities uh, all over the country. But I would also base it on what research independently uh, has to say about what really works. Uh, my full-time job is uh, with Edison Learning, uh, but I also wear a second hat as a social scientist working with people like Rick Hanyashek, who I'll be pleased to share. I was with him over the weekend. He'll be pleased to hear many times he was referenced uh, today as, a, as, a, as an important economist in this field. But uh, whether you're looking at the research or whether you're looking at the practical experience, both for-profit and not-for-profit working in this space, um, I think it's pretty clear that there are a small number of things that deserve focus. First thing that I would place an emphasis on is the quality of teachers. Uh, there is nothing more important. It's been said over and over, but it can't be emphasized enough. Uh, a high-quality teacher can utterly transform the life uh, of a child in a very short period of time. The problem is um, that we have a system right now uh, that doesn't reward teacher effectiveness. It rewards teacher credentials. And I'll just say it right now, uh, the teacher credentials have nothing to do uh, with teacher performance. And we should not be investing in a system that promotes that. Instead, we should be investing in a system that measures teachers, teacher effectiveness as they're trying to do in Washington, D.C., as they're trying to do in New York City and other places. Uh, but this is this has proven to be a very difficult thing to do, uh, largely for political reasons, but also uh, also for technical reasons. There is very little that can be deter that can be measured about the quality of a teacher until you see the results that he or she gets in the classroom, and we should be investing very heavily in that. Now, that happens to be where technology can be uh, very important. Um, no child left behind. Uh, which has required now the annual testing uh, of children for the last six years is an, important step, uh, is an important step in that direction. The accountability systems that support that are important. But if technology, if, if rather, if accountability is going to really make a difference, you begin by holding schools accountable, then you want to hold teachers accountable, and then after that, 
you really want to be able to hold students accountable. At the very least, you want to know exactly what kind of progress each student is making. Technology now makes it possible to gauge the progress of every child, literally from kindergarten on through 12th grade, and to do it on a regular basis and to take that into account as we make, uh, make decisions as teachers and principals about what to do for our kids, about who to accelerate, about who to remediate, and about exactly what to do to meet their needs. Technology makes it possible to support a system of accountability that works from the school level to the teacher level to the individual level, and the systems that do that should be invested in. Likewise, systems that make it possible to measure the value added performance uh, of teachers. Um, Ten years ago, before the advent of annualized testing, it was impossible. Before the development of adequate technologies to support that, it was impossible. Today, we're able to do that on a regular basis. The federal government, the state governments, private businesses should be invest investing in enterprises that build state data systems, that build school-based systems, that allow us to have the ability to make intelligent decisions about who's doing a good job and who is not, about how to reward and how to remove, and about how to instruct individual kids. And technology can help us drive teacher quality. But there's another part of teacher quality that's not going to be driven by fine-tuning information systems, and that is the raw material that's brought into the schools today. It was said at lunch, and we've heard it many times, this nation does not, on average, attract our most talented individuals into teaching. On average, our teaching pool is filled by individuals that do not come from the upper distribution of the, of, the, uh, talent, uh, of the talent distribution in America's colleges and universities. They're drawn more from the bottom. And a lot of this has to do with the nature of the career that we've provided for teachers. Lockstep pay, rules and regulations that make it difficult to be creative, that stifle innovation, and a lack of compensation. Technology provides an interesting opportunity to correct this problem. Right now, we run schools pretty much the same as we have for the last couple hundred years, which is to say that kids come into a classroom, one teacher is responsible for those kids, the ratios may be 20 to 1, 15 to 1, 25 to 1, but whatever it is, that's the way a school works. Technology, which makes it possible to teach kids online, to teach kids via the internet, to teach kids through remedial programs, accelerated programs, those are off in the corner. They're extras in the school day. It doesn't have to be that way. Everybody knows that we all learn best on our own, through engaging with information, through practicing. That's what learning is all about. It's not sitting and listening to a teacher. Teachers know this as well. We can, with the benefit of technology today, create a school experience that's different where kids are working one-on-one -on -one with a, te a teacher in a traditional setting for part of the day, but other parts of the day, they're working with technology, whether for remediation or acceleration. There are many, many examples of this. We could change the mixture of technology and teachers in our schools right now that would allow us to run first-rate schools with fewer teachers, and we could pay those teachers more. And if we did that, we would attract and retain better people into the profession. Every other industry on the face of the planet has been transformed by technology, efficiency and effectiveness. It's yet to come to public education. But as it does, not only will it do a better job instructing, but it will help us bring better people into the teaching force, and that's ultimately what's critical for improving outcomes for our kids. Okay, thank you. Ted, uh, comments, and we can make this part as interactive as you'd like. Comments and questions from Ted. Hopefully, hopefully very, very interactive, and uh, um, uh, I want to sec second what uh, Catherine said at the beginning. I mean, you guys are terrifically accomplished and, and wonderful examples of what we've been talking about today, and, and also great, great, great colleagues uh, to all of us. So let me ask a couple of questions just to, to get us started. And, and Michelle and Jason, I'll, I'll start uh, with, with you guys. You've set out a bold agenda for the DC public school system, uncompromising in its focus on results, uh, unconcerned uh, with the political uh, um, fallout 
of the decisions that you're having to make. Um, as, as a representative of the public, uh, you, you, know, you talk about uh, achievement test gains. You talk about administrative changes that you're making. You talk, talk about a, a so root and branch accountability system. All of that's very exciting. As a, as a representative of the public, what am I going to see, and when am I going to see it, and how am I going to know that you've turned the corner? So um, I think you're already seeing uh, the results of what we've begun to do. Um, the, we, we got our first year achievement results back, um, and uh, they, were, they were very solid. Um, we saw an 8 percentage point gain in elementary reading, an 11 percentage point gain in elementary math, and 9 points each in uh, secondary reading and math. Um, those one-year gains um, uh, outdid the four prior year gains all put together. Um, so we, we know that we're beginning to make some progress. It's going to be very difficult for us um, to continue to see that level um, going forward, but that's absolutely what our goal is. And, you know, people all the time sort of ask us, well, what, what, how are you going to measure um, your effectiveness? How are you going to measure your progress? And certainly there are other measures that, that can help us along the way um, in terms of, uh, you know, parental and student uh, and teacher satisfaction. Um, uh, things like attendance behavior, those sorts of things, but um, really for us those are those are secondary indicators to student achievement levels first and foremost. Um, our goal long term is to ensure that we are the highest performing school district, uh, urban school district in the country and that we close the achievement gap between wealthy white students and um, poor minority students. I you know, I just have this sort of um, subjective metric in my mind when I think about teachers and human capital in D.C., and it goes something like this. Uh, when every single parent in D.C., regardless of where they live in D.C., would be completely fine if a lottery decided which teacher they had in D.C., we've done our job. When am I going to expect that? <laughs> I defer to my boss. <laughs> um, we, uh, we talk about so two Fenty terms. Um, I think within eight years, we can see a massive, massive change. That's a new um, metric in the investment community, a Fenty term. <laughs> a Fenty it's term. It's like a uh, Fermi unit. Uh, uh, but I think even with, within five years, um, you'll see a, a vastly different system um, than you did when we walked in. So Mark, five years. Um, <laughs> So we've talked a lot uh, uh, for both of you, and then I want to transition to John and John. Uh, we've talked a lot today about accountability and different ways of thinking about accountability. We've also talked about the importance of making information transparent about student progress and the performance of the system. Uh, I happen to believe that the ultimate accountability in education is the public. And they are the parents and the communities and the kids that we're all aiming to serve. So how are you going about building demand and support for the reforms that you have in mind from that ultimate source of accountability? I think that's a great question. Um, and one of the things that we, we saw through the, through the school closing process, we closed 23 schools in the system, um, about 15% of our total inventory, which is was a significant number, obviously. Um, and one of the things that we, one of the phenomena that we saw coming out of this was that um, we had a number of schools uh, where the achievement levels were extraordinarily low. Um, and we had uh, parents and community members who were fighting to the death to, to keep these schools open. Um, and what we know, we, we have to change that dynamic. We have to get to a point where, um, you know, when we have a school where 9 or 10 percent of the kids are performing at grade level, that the parents are coming to us and they're demanding that that school is closed down and that um, a, a better school uh, is, is given as an option. And I think that it's incumbent upon us as the district to begin to shift that dynamic, to, uh, to have the, um, the data on hand to begin the advocacy efforts where we really uh, start to inform and then empower parents about, you know, with the information that they need. So if your child is not operating on grade level by the time they're in third grade, the chances that they ever will are slim to none. And this is how it impacts their life chances and their life outcome and, and their earning potential. And I think only when we as a district begin to, to, to run those kinds of advocacy efforts will we really 
begin to see the kind of demand within the public education sphere that we need. John Chubb, sticking with the same issue of, of demand, Hewlett Packard uh, was known for a, about a decade as a as a company that was um, great at building products uh, for engineer by engineers for engineers. And as I listened to your description of uh, an education system of the future that's very different from the one that we have now, this question of demand is really the one that, that's just right in front of my face. You know, Clay Christensen's new book uh, would, would say that uh, changing the system from where it is to the system you describe is a near impossible task because um, most families in America, as we've talked a lot about today, are perfectly content, even if they're grading the schools at B and C, sort of at least with the structure of school that's familiar to them. How, how, do, you, how do we move uh, um, the body politic to create a demand for something that, that looks different, that smells different? They walk into a classroom, it doesn't feel right. I think, I think there, there's a couple things going on. Um, one, is the, one is the phenomenon that uh, Michelle talked about, which is really about transparency. And over the last generation, parents have learned a lot more about the performance of their schools than they knew before. Uh, inner city parents who once thought that they had no choice but to just go to the neighborhood school that was you know, placed in front of them, now are the strongest supporters of having alternatives and options. And that comes through, through transparency and making results visible. Uh, and, um, and the more transparent we are about performance, the more that's going to change. Um, I, I, I have to believe uh, that the states in the nation right now that have established low standards and have low proficiency levels, um, that, that as they give their kids rewards <laughs> for achieving at low levels, that that will be exposed and parents in those states will rise up against that. So I think, I think that transparency is a powerful, powerful cure for the, uh, for the public's lack of understanding and lack of demand. The second thing is that um, the disjunction between the experience of kids in school and the experience of kids out of school is becoming so dramatic that school boards all over the country are under pressure from parents. And I'm talking about middle class parents, suburban parents who say, well, you know, my kids are, you know, they're, they're graduating, they're getting into a decent college, you know, um, why should I be concerned? The, the experience of kids sitting in a classroom without access, access to technology, listening to a teacher, doing worksheets, the same kind of activities that they've done for generations and generations is just growing unacceptable. And that is going to place pressure on boards of education to begin to think more creatively, uh, more creatively about school. Right now, school is the least technologically interesting place that kids spend their day. And that's not going to be tolerated forever. John, you spoke uh, um, clearly but briefly about social enterprise mm -hmm. being uh, a place where innovative uh, experiments, if you will, are taking, are taking place and that the interaction between new leaders for new schools and the districts in which you work, the communities in which you work, and uh, the interaction between other uh, social enterprises, socially, social entrepreneur uh, enterprises, uh, may be a lever for that broader system change. Uh, as I look at investing in social enterprises, that's a really intriguing leverage point. Can you talk a little bit more about how you see new leaders' role in that, in the districts where you work, and then maybe more broadly how you see social enterprise uh, interacting with uh, the, the more traditional system? Yeah, I think I mean, we start, I think all of us, or those of us who are looking at the, um, the facts in education today, to, um, by seeing that we're really in a dangerous place in terms of our outcomes for kids at this point in this country. Um, Things are not working the way they need to. That doesn't mean that we had some golden age of education which we need to return to. In fact, just on this to highlight the point about where we are, um, we have slipped from first in the world in high school graduation rates to the bottom half of industrialized countries. We have slipped from first in the world as a nation in terms of percentage of our, our population that has college degrees to seventh in the world. We are slipping significantly. In both of those metrics, as an example, we actually haven't gone backwards on either one in terms of the absolute numbers. We've held steady, 
But the problem is, is, is that the rest of the world is accelerating their pace of improvement, and we are getting left behind. Um, and there have been lots of other data that's been shared today. And then, of course, the, the tragedy of the imp outcomes for kids based on what zip code they're in or what teacher they've got or what school they're in is just as dire as the, how far we're, we're, the fact we're slipping behind the rest of the world. So we're not working in a public education system today that is getting the results we want for kids. At the same time, 90% um, of our students are in public schools. If we don't find a way through both support and, yes, competition and pressure to dramatically change the way we as a country change education for all of our kids, um, we're not going to succeed. And there are some school systems that are making really smart, focused efforts to make improvement. And I would say those systems, by the way, are attracting some of the best talents in the country. I will note that DC, under Chancellor Reed's leadership, or New Orleans, interestingly, or in New York under Chancellor Klein's leadership, it is easier for us to attract talented people to become principals in those places where those systems are actually demanding results and accountability. You'd think it might be the opposite, like talented people would want to shy away from those places and go somewhere else. But in fact, the systems that are focusing on real transformation results for kids and accountability are attracting principals and teachers to a degree that others aren't. But that said, there are many school systems in America, most, that, um, that haven't found the right solutions on a bunch of fronts yet. And rather than replacing them, I think the question is, how do you take a sector like education, where current spending on R&D and research and development is a fraction of what's spent in the business world, and how do you actually invest in the R&D for the next generation of solutions that actually will work for kids? And most school systems that are failing right now to make, get the results you want, you want to help them try some things out, but they're not necessarily always the best places to try new ways of generating principals or teachers or charter schools or after school programs. And that's what leads to I, the organization, organization like a New Leaders for New Schools or others to create solutions that are scalable for, for school systems. And at New Leaders, I just would say, as a closing comment on this front, is that uh, we are seeing results that, in fact, are better than the systems we're in. I, mean, I, was, I, mean, I, I think we all ought to be transparent that we're far from where we want. But DC is attracting the best principles. Chancellor's leadership and focus on ach achievement and accountability and empowerment is great. At the same time, our new leader's principles, as solid as the results were in DC, our principles were getting faster progress overall than the DCPS. And we ought to be doing that. Um, and, uh, and she's going to make us better and push us harder. But, but in many places, the systems aren't even close. And so we are creating, in New Leaders' case, a new kind of principle. We're learning about what it takes, what characteristics you need to come in with when you select principles in the front end, and what characteristics in the front end correlate to student achievement gains on the, out, on the back end. And we're learning about what skills principles have and what principal behaviors actually happen in order to drive achievement gains. And we're creating a whole system for attracting and developing principles that not only has produced 550 new leaders serving a quarter million kids around the country, but it's creating a new model for what school systems can do. The final point, the principal issue happens to be a scalable, solvable problem. We only have uh, 90,000 plus public schools in the country. There are only 10,000 urban public schools serving at least half kids from low-income families. So we've got 10,000 schools in that um, category. 8% attrition rates means that we only have 800 new principals a year we need for urban low-income schools. And we believe at New Leaders and more broadly, this is a solvable problem to attract and bring in 800 new principals a year into urban low-income schools. We'll take on 25% of that, but the rest of the country certainly can do the other 75%. So let me follow, follow up on, on that. Um, so when a New Leaders principal goes into, you're now developing a, a, a track record and data and, and some real hard numbers on the effectiveness of new leaders in their schools. And you're showing achievement test gains, uh, uh, accelerating achievement test gains, which, uh, gains, which is terrific. But as I, I heard you say that there, those are differential gains. And one of the variables about how much faster those test uh, scores go up is the, is the leadership of the district more broadly stated the context of the district. Can you solve the principalship without solving the district? John Chubb, you mentioned this as well, that there are, these are sort of nested uh, systems, one in, one in the other, from the classroom to the school to the district, perhaps to the state and to the nation. So you're, you've stuck your stake in at the, at the school site level. How, how vulnerable is the success of new schools uh, to, to the overall district context. I mean, clearly both are important. What I would say is, is that if you just rely on school system efforts and policy efforts without getting the people right, you're not going to succeed. If you just focus on an inflow of people without the systems, that won't succeed. You actually really do critically need both. 
we have studied um, the difference between the schools that we've had getting dramatic gains versus those getting incremental gains. Because some of our people are getting, we had the most improved school in California, it was, was a monarch, a charter school. We had the most improved school in Illinois, it was Dodge Renaissance, a district school with more autonomy. We had a lot of dramatic improving schools, and we have a lot of schools that aren't getting dramatic improvements. We've studied the difference, and I don't have time, I know, to go into this. I'd say if anybody wants to look, we've got an urban excellence framework report on the front page of our website, which is at www nlns.org, for newleadersnewschools.org. But there's some very clear lessons that we're seeing in the schools that are getting big gains. And what I would say is they all come down into the areas of goal and data-driven instructional improvement, school culture, talent management, operations and processes, and personal leadership. And in those five areas, there are specific things that can be done by improving the kind of principle you bring in and train, and their implications for policy, including school systems that invest deeply in creating a real merit-based career ladder for educators, creating data tools to improve achievement and creating a systemic context that, re context that rewards um, performance and empowers people to get results to, to do even more. Ted, I know sure. we're going uh, to talk about systemic reforms uh, in, a, in, a, in a little bit, so I'll just say a word about this. But um, this, this question of leadership, leadership is crucial. Uh, but when, when social scientists look at this, they, they use the term uh, that leadership is endogenous. Uh, if a poet was, uh, was looking at this, they might say, no man is an island. And that's to say that the kind of leadership you get is a function of the kind of system that you put people in. So if you have a system that rewards managerial behavior and compliance and going along, you're going to attract, you may attract some people who want to make a difference, but they end up being the mavericks who are working around the system. Uh, the systems that are going to have the leaders that have the attributes that, uh, that John's talking about here are systems that are going to reward and recognize, recognize that uh, and not dis discourage it, as so many of our systems do. But the systems, you know, the systems are creatures of politics. And politics are not, gonna, are not going to, for long, um, uh, sustain the maverick. Ted, let me throw out one question here, and then Great. we're going to move on to the second part. Uh, John Chubb, you talked about changing the mix of technology and teachers in the classroom. And if we were looking at this as a business saying, how do we make it more efficient? In fact, we would be saying, how can one teacher do the same thing or more or for more children? We haven't been able to replicate the kind of efficiency gains in, gains in the rest of the economy because we've been on a smaller class size um, trend in this country. So let me take frame it as the flip side of what you said. Do we need to, to start selling larger classes and better teachers, and is that a saleable concept? And maybe you comment, John, and then let everybody else jump in. Yeah, it's, um, uh, it, it's kind of the, you know, the, the Goldilocks principle. I mean, it's not that, that, they, it's not that you want to have them too big or too small. You want to have them just right for the purpose that you're undertaking. So um, there are some kids that need tutoring. One-on-one, uh, -on -one. and for, for some kids and for some needs, that's appropriate. Um, there are other times when you want small group instruction, and you might have 10, 10 kids with a, with a teacher. But there are other times when the classes can get quite large, uh, or where the, the subject can be learned very effectively online, where you have one really superb teacher supported by technology reaching hundreds of kids simultaneously. So um, the, the, the trick here is to figure out, you know, what's the, instru what's the instructional goal and what's the right mix of teacher and technology for that? And currently, we're locked into a system that is, um, that's so standardized that we don't really get a chance to, to learn, that, learn those lessons. I mean, if you take high school as the obvious example, I mean, in, uh, in, in 11th and 12th grade, we think that kids have to be instructed in groups of 20 and 25. But a year later, we send them off to group great universities where they're working in classes with 300, and we think that that's just fine. And it is. <laughs> it is. So we have to learn how to mix the instructional setting and the number of teachers with what we're trying to accomplish. Do you want to layer on with that? I mean, what I, what I would add to what John just said from the point of view of someone who here is, re is representing the broad public's interest in getting radically better is, is to say that we also need, and we haven't talked a lot about it, we need the freedom from bunches of kinds of policy uh, constraints. 
uh, uh, administrative constraints to be able to work on these issues, to identify what works, and then to double down on, on those things that, that work. And I mean, that, that logic flow is one of the things I think that one of the reasons why we're structuring this panel the way we are is that that whole logic flow is so different from the flow of logic, the logic conversation that most educators have most of the time. I think that's part of the problem, though, in public education is that we have a lot of research that shows that class size reduction, especially at the levels that we're talking about, doesn't really doesn't make matter. a difference. But I mean, if you hear people talk about what should we spend our money on, people are always talking about class size reduction. I mean, we started a new initiative uh, a little while ago to pay middle school students for doing well in school, putting a little over a million dollars into it, and people, you know, sort of were haranguing me of, you should, you should put the money into lowering class size. I thought, I could lower the class size in maybe 10 classrooms across the city with that um, you know, amount of money and you know, the, the impact that it would have would be questionable. Meanwhile, with this amount of money, with this particular innovation, we can actually have an impact on you know, over 3,000 kids and really determine whether or not that is going to influence um, how they think about school as they're beginning to formulate and crystallize their ideas about education and its meaning and its purpose. So I, I just think that part of what we have to do in education is to is to sort of say it instead of just the rhetoric of let, let's lower class sizes because that just seems like a, a nice thing to do that we actually have to say you know what and we have to be aggressive about saying class size reduction has not worked in the past it's, it's not been something where we see huge gains for the money that we put in so let's move on okay and let's move on on our panel topic too <laughs> so um, part two of this is really to look at the longer term and to say how do we protect the incredible work that reformers like our panelists are doing in the public education sector and I wanted to just introduce the concept of entropy which is one from physics which states that every large complicated system will decay and fall apart across time without the constant input of new fresh energy so you all really are the new fresh energy turning things around how do we protect these reforms and these changes across time from the very real tendency for standards to relax because we don't have the pressure of the marketplace for public education instead we have a highly politicized highly regulated area so starting with Michelle all sorts of things in your portfolio like mayoral control and you're operating in a city with um, a declining demand with a declining population what are the things that you hold on to that can help sustain what you're doing across time so I, I have a, a, a maybe a different point of view on this from a, from a lot of um, superintendents I think one of the key uh, things that we have to ensure is going on in, in our district is the um, partnerships with external um, and nonprofit or for-profit entities. Um, you know, uh, uh, New Leaders, Teach for America, the New Teacher Project, KIPP, I mean all of these organizations they they provide a wedge and they provide a level of innovation that we could never sort of do um, in house. And a lot of people say, well, you know, we want to we want to learn from these organizations for a couple of years and then we want to bring it in house and we want to be able to fish on our own or you know that sort of thing. Why? I mean, these people do this better than than we possibly ever could, I think. Um, and uh, and they they bring this energy and this innovation where they're just constantly. You you know, sort of out there seeing the best practices of dozens of districts across the country, they're always going to be able to be to spark change in a different way than we would be able to on our own. Um, so I think that that energy of having those partners um, in the mix is, is a huge part to ensuring that we can keep the the uh, the sort of momentum going. That's great, John Schnur. Um have you thought about what systemic reforms you wish you had so that your principles would not just deliver better results but would stay? Um, well, there's systemic reforms at the, um, at the new leader organizational level that um, we're focused on. And I guess one of the most important things is that we do spend our time thinking about what can we as an organization do in order to keep driving results given the systems as they are. I think that, that in our best principles all do that, kind of keep this focus of personal responsibility and agency on what you can do to make things better, even under current circumstances. And I think that one of the big culture changes that's needed in education is a system-wide focus from wherever you are on what you can do with things as they are. 
Um, that said, in terms of um, policy changes, I'd say a couple. Um, one is, I think as a country, um, uh, or a city, uh, as a start, uh, or several, um, I think we need to make um, an education profession um, the um, uh, most prestigious and attractive career um, that there is in America. And it, it should be revered when people go into teaching and to school leadership, and it should be revered when people get great results. Um, I think people shouldn't be honored just for being teachers. They should be honored for being teachers who get great results for kids um, measured in different ways. So I think making this an, an honored profession would be huge. I think actually having standards, uh, very, very clear standards um, for what kids need to be able to know and be able to do in good data systems to help make improvements. And I do think um, managing a, a profession, empowering talent, investing in skill development, making it an attractive place for people to stay at the system level are all really important policies. But without those, we can still make progress. And John Chubb, um, your role as a political scientist as, as well as a for-profit provider? Well, uh, I, I think to the, to the country's credit, um, over the last generation, um, the three most important steps uh, towards creating a better system have been taken. There's a long, long way to go. Uh, but if you think back 25 years to when the Nation at Risk report uh, was released, um, there was no transparency, very little transparency into student performance. Uh, there were no accountability systems, and there was no choice. And I think that fundamentally, um, if, you're, uh, if, you're, if you're a taxpayer, if you're a parent, uh, you want to have a system where we know how the kids are doing. And that's all about building systems in to provide transparency. You want to have accountability where results matter. And a generation ago, there was no accountability. And then finally, uh, you want to have a system that does invite innovation. Now, in 1991, the very first charter school law uh, was passed. Uh, small voucher bills were introduced along the way. Um, if you go back over this almost 20-year history of providing choice, what you see is that uh, leaving aside debates about the results and how much achievement has been affected here or not been affected there, what choice has done has opened the system up to organizations like KIPP and a green dot and aspire and the organizations that are supported by the new schools venture fund to for profit organizations like uh, like edison and national heritage and and victory to organizations like teach for america and new leaders for new schools these organizations which are bringing ideas and energy and innovation to public education would not be there without a system that encouraged choice and that had accountability and transparency. And to me, those are the three crucial systemic foundations for better, better schools. And Jason, from your um, micro focus on the human capital you're trying to attract to DC, what do you think about the long term and how that's going to be sustained? You know, I think the, the greater the focus on quality talent, um, the better off we're going to be. I think quality talent begets quality talent. Well, as I said before, high quality people want to work with other high quality people. It creates the environment that attracts the kind of people you want. I, I would just say on a more macro level, I was thinking sort of what, would, what helps institutionalize this sort of continuous learning. And I think it just comes down to sort of three things. One, measure everything. Two, stop doing things that aren't working. And three, be courageous to try just about anything. I think if you just sort of religiously stick to those three things and get everybody in the organization to sort of religiously stick to those three things, the engine keeps turning. So Ted, a few reactions, and then we're going to save the last couple minutes for any audience questions. We have uh, John Daisy. Dr. Daisy, are you here? Uh, in the audience who will refer back any audience questions. So if you have anything for Dr. Daisy, flag him down. We'll do a few more questions up here and then take some from the floor. Ted. So a couple, a couple words that we keep, keep coming back to, uh, not only in this conversation, but, but today. And, and one is uh, innovation and the, the desire for innovation from virtually every quarter. Uh, the exciting news about the AFT's innovation fund, uh, the conversations that uh, at the national level, uh, Senator Obama's uh, uh, declaration of his, his support for, for innovation, supporting what, uh, what works fund. Um, here on this panel, I mean, this is clearly a panel of innovators. And I think, uh, Catherine, your, your question about what is it that we can do to sustain these innovations 
is really brought up to the generic level. What is it that we can do to sustain innovation more broadly, you know, an stream of innovation of which, of which our panelists are, are certainly great leaders. And I, and I think that John, I, I wholeheartedly endorse uh, John Chubb's point of view that in the last 15 years we have created a, a, a new way of thinking about schools that introduces the concept of a public market uh, um, still, uh, public schools uh, uh, run for the, in, in the public's interest, a mix of profit and for-profit providers of those educational services. Uh, the pioneering work that Ed Edison has done, the pioneering work that the, that, uh, the Kips and the Aspires have done, all of that is part of a stream of innovation that is made possible by a combination of choice, transparency, and accountability. So for my money, I see the spirit of innovation as one that now has much broader policy support uh, across the, <clears throat> the land than it, than it ever has. At the next level down, I think that the states probably still have some work to do to make more of that innovation more possible on a daily basis, whether that's relief from provisions of onerous education codes, selective uh, waivers on certain policies. Uh, I think that that, that that may be a part of the next frontier for helping to support uh, uh, the kind of really path-breaking innovation that we're talking about today. I think it's no, uh, uh, no small moment that the extraordinary gains that we're seeing in D.C. are happening in uh, that most, that unlikeliest of place where a city and a state are really uh, the same geography. And I think in New Orleans, another place, place where there is a path-breaking work, Paul Pastrak is, is here today, that there's incredible congruence between state leadership and, and district leadership. And, that, and so I, I think that, that that kind of protection is, is, uh, is really quite, quite important. Great. All right. Dr. Daisy. So let's start with three general questions. Um, the first one would be, given the work that you are all talking about in terms of facilitating both the innovation and kind of escalating that innovation, what would be the policies that you would desire at a state, or federal, or even a board level that could make this happen um, with greater ease. And to whom should that question be directed? Was there a request? Uh, no, there wasn't a request. Okay. So. Who would like to take it? Well, I, I mean, I would point to what Michelle is trying to do in D.C. as an example of the kind of uh, the kind of flexibility that you're looking for. I mean, you you want. You, you, want to, you want to make it possible for schools to try out innovations. If, if, you leave, if you leave the borders of the United States and you look abroad to what's being done with technology and what's being done with class size and what's doing, being done with alternative forms of school organization, there's a lot of ideas out there and there's a lot of innovations to try, but our system won't allow it. So you have class size regulations and you have rules governing uh, teacher compensation and you know the gamut of things that make it impossible to do schools differently and what you'd like is a zone of infra innovation where a where a strong principal with a strong track record could be given the resources and say all right show us how to organize a school differently we'll hold you accountable for the outcomes but the rest of it is entirely up to you I think there are a few um, a few areas where I think we have real evidence um, uh, that more investment in policy change can make a big difference. Um, Catherine, uh, I think if you were a panelist, would be speaking about this, but I think there's no question that investing in a really qua quality early childhood education in preschool, particularly for kids from low-income backgrounds, done in a quality way, um, has a big, big impact on get getting kids ready for success in school. And that's something which, if you're in a K-12 system, you can't do on your own without significant policy change. So that is, that's one second. Um, I do think that having really rigorous standards about what kids should know and be able to do by the end of each year and a really good data system that actually makes data useful to educators and parents and students to make improvements is key. And this is not that kind of maybe interesting to the public necessarily, a policy issue, but the schools that we see making the biggest improvements are schools where the data is really used and useful, where teachers and kids understand where they are compared to where they need to be. They use that on a regular basis, week, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, in order to make improvements, since so that would be a big, a big policy. And the third one I would focus on is, uh, given how important talent is, I do think as a country, if we can, or in communities, find a way to raise um, compensation for teachers and principals, to pay educators better, and create ways to have a career where if you do better, 
You can get more pay and more responsibilities. Actually, an exciting merit-based career where you can kind of move up in terms of responsibility and pay on top of some base pay increases in places that don't have them. Those three policies could make a big difference. Okay, so we unfortunately are out of time. Ted, any final concluding comments? I just want to thank our uh, panel today, Catherine, and thank you, um, but particularly the panel for their work today, but much more importantly, the work that you do every day with, with kids and teachers and reforming the system from the ground up. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. You all are doing awesome us. work. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, for security purposes, it is